In previous videos, we saw four different situations in which porous materials suffer frost damage. Trapped water, hydraulic pressure, crystallization pressure, and salt scaling. A common point of all the analysis was to consider a spatially uniform temperature. We also underlined how coarse materials, particularly if not fully saturated, may allow water to be pushed away from the freezing front thus avoiding damaging stresses from developing. Further to this, we saw how growth of ice in empty pores or air voids produces suction in the liquid that leads to the porous matrix feeling a compressive stress. In this video, we see how materials with larger pores, such as sedimentary stones, may be damaged if a temperature gradient is sustained. This represents our case 5 of freezing damage. It not only affects buildings, but also sculpts mountains. Before discussing freezing in large pores, we must recall the existence of an unfrozen film of water on the pore wall. For this, we return to the illustration given in our video on crystallization pressure, where we considered that a crystal had grown in a large pore having two smaller entries that can only be entered at a temperature lower than the one imposed. As temperature drops, the large crystal consequently bulges into those pore entries without being able to invade them. It also fills the whole large pore, except for a liquid film, on the order of one nanometer thick, that remains between its surface and the pore wall as explained in our video on crystallization pressure. Let us consider the implication of this on a cylindrical pore with a large radius r connecting both to a larger empty pore and the outer surface with an ice crystal nucleated in it. The radius of the cylindrical pore is large enough so that its curvature has a negligible effect on the melting point of ice. As ice grows in that pore, it initially exerts a crystallization pressure equal to 1.2 times delta T, the undercooling. As this crystal grows, water is expelled into the void and at the surface. The growth of unstressed ice in those locations exerts suction on the pore water which can, at least partially, offset the crystallization pressure. Once all the water has frozen, the unstressed crystals can have drawn enough water so that the crystal in this pore is also unstressed and in equilibrium with those crystals and the unfrozen film. With this in mind, let us consider a partially saturated body with a large, water-filled pore connected both to the material interior, on the left, and to the external surface of the body, on the right, by smaller pores that are also filled with water. Additionally, we consider this large pore to be connected through another water-filled pore to an empty pore, which itself is linked to the outer surface by an empty pore. If the temperature decreases uniformly throughout the body, ice will first form in the larger pore. As it grows, it pushes water into unfilled pores and to the outer surface where it may freeze and grow without restraint. The situation is different in a temperature gradient with warm water on one side of the body and freezing temperatures on the other as can be found in an exterior wall of a building. The stress-free external ice draws water to it through surface films and unfrozen small pores. However, water removed in this way from the freezing zone of the material is replaced by water flowing in from the warmer region in response to the suction caused by the ice growth in unrestrained spaces. The result is a dynamic equilibrium where the stress on the pore walls is sustained by continuous freezing and melting in the ice film 
pore wall interfacial region. Contrary to the case of a spatially homogeneous temperature, previously discussed, flow from the unfrozen side sustains this dynamic process and does not allow the crystal to become unstressed. As an example, we consider that zero degrees Celsius is reached to the left of our large pore and that ice begins to form in the colder region to its right. Where the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, the ice pushes against the pore walls with a pressure of 1.2 times delta T. So, the pressure is higher in the colder zone. In our illustration, liquid water can be supplied not only through liquid films, but also through the finer pores, even if the ice has started to form in the larger of the two connecting pores. Macro cracks in the frozen zone are likely to form perpendicular to the direction of the temperature gradient, unless they are influenced by pre-existing floors or zones of weakness. Such situations of a temperature gradient with a source of warm water can therefore lead materials with rather coarse pores to suffer from freezing damage, even if their pore size distribution does not make them susceptible to hydraulic pressure or curvature-induced crystallization pressure under spatially uniform temperature. Once cracks form, they themselves become zones of unrestrained growth where ice lenses may develop. Moreover, the loss of cohesion due to cracking means that pushing the detached material away does not require much force and may take place without filling the whole volume of the cracks. Therefore, as long as flow from the warmer zone persists, the cracks will gradually lengthen. However, if the temperature becomes very low, say below minus 15 degrees Celsius, the mobility of water molecules in the film may be so low that further growth is inhibited. The same mechanism is responsible for frost heave in soil, where ice lenses form in a cold subsurface region and lift the surface of the soil. For this reason and for simplicity, in future videos we will refer to damage developed in a temperature gradient as frost heave, even if it occurs in building materials or natural stone. In conclusion, coarse porous materials can be damaged during freezing if a temperature gradient is sustained such that water can move from an unfrozen region to feed growth of ice in the pores of a frozen region. Such situations are typical of frost heave, but also can cause damage in sedimentary building stones and in geological settings.